Good morning, everyone, bright and early, and welcome to my guest bedroom slash office. Uh, the furry red lump in the background is my dog who refuses to come out from under the covers much before 8.30. Would that we all had that kind of luxury. Um, in today's lectures, um, because I can't be with you guys physically, what I really want to do is try to introduce you to the vibrant, fascinating world of Sasanian Persia um, with, with sort of back-to-back -back treatments, first of the sort of historical rise of the Sasanian Persians, and then with a little bit more of a mystery-oriented video on the governance structure or the governing principles of Sasanian Persia. I really appreciate your guys' patience uh, with me on this one day. I confess I'm having sort of throwbacks to the early months of COVID when I spent a lot of time in this room uh, creating video lectures. But luckily for us, we're now on the tail end of that process and this is gonna be a one day only uh, adventure. Boy, I've really forgotten how grainy uh, my, my camera on my MacBook is. I think this might be a signal it's time for a new computer. So. I think my birthday's already passed, but maybe we'll give it a whirl. All right, well, if you're ready, let's go ahead and get started. If this is the first video that you're watching, I actually think this is the better place to start because I'm gonna give you a sort of foundational sense of the rise of Sasanian Persia with one of the most important characters of that empire, Ardashir I, the founding father of the Sasanians. Okay, let's go ahead and dive in. So before spring break got started, I had gently alluded in my lectures on Zenobia to the fact that in the Roman East, we saw a shift in the third century over who controlled the main territory of Persia. And we had shifted from the Parthian Empire to a rise of a new Persian Empire, which are now broadly known as the Sasanian Persians for reasons I'll explain in a minute. Now, from the Roman perspective, I don't think that they necessarily recognized a huge shift. Um, Romans tended to see the East as a pretty homogenous group of Medes slash Parthians slash Persians. Of course, for the, the Parthians themselves, they certainly recognized this as a massive political shift as their entire royal family was essentially overturned by the rise of a new uh, conquering family the extent to which people on the borders of the Sasanian Empire noticed a political shift, that's a much harder question to get at. I also thought it was striking, though, in our readings um, that when we look at some of the Sasanian Persian inscriptions, they will sometimes refer to all Westerners as Romans. Um, when I was a graduate student, I took some classes on Sasanian history and religion, and one of the funniest things I spotted as a young classic student was Sasanians referring to Alexander the Great as Alexander the Roman. And of course, I thought this was hysterical because Alexander, you know, his heyday was at least 300 years before the rise of the Roman Empire. But I think what it shows us is that in the same way the Romans are thinking about the East as general Persia, the Eastern world is looking at the West and thinking very much general Rome. So where we'll sort of pick up is where the Parthian Empire leaves off. And what's going to be important to emphasize is that the Sasanian Persian world geographically is going to look a lot like the Parthian Empire, maybe a little bit bigger in some places, um, but that the empire they had replaced was nothing to sneeze at. The Parthians had really been in power from the 200s BCE right up until the 200s CE. So we have an empire that lasts almost the duration of the Roman Republic, right? 500 odd years. Um, and, and it's it's striking how hard it is to find evidence of such a seismic shift in the governance of the ancient world's greatest land-based empire. In order to get clear on the sort of region, the people, the language, the chronology that we're talking about, I wanted to pause for just a minute and go over a few terminologies and timelines. The Romans described the Persians as Persians because of their knowledge of one relatively small region of the Persian Empire known as Pars, or sometimes pronounced Fars. 
this Pars Fars root is where we get the name for Farsi, right? A modern language still spoken uh, in Iran and other parts of the Middle East. But the Iranians themselves or the people in the Persian Empire, especially in the ruling family, did not recognize themselves as Parthians or as Persians. Instead, the terminology that they found most helpful was the, the term Iran or um, the land of the Aryans within their own language. I always bristle a little bit when people pronounce it Iran uh, just because uh, in, you know, in, in its ancient linguistic terminology, it was probably closer to Iran. Um, now, the word Iran or Aryan can sometimes make people perk up a little bit because they hear, oh my gosh, Aryan Brotherhood. Like, isn't that the foundation of, uh, you know, Nazism, this belief in an Aryan race? And that's certainly true. But before we go too, too far down that rabbit hole, I just want to clarify that the word Aryan is incredibly old. Um, it's, it's dated all the way back to classical Sanskrit. And it just really meant in the ancient world, a noble or an honorable people. And at the time of the Parthians and of the Sasanian Persians, Iran was just the land of the Aryans or the land for the Aryan people. Um, and, and these two concepts were sort of mutually reinforcing, right? People who lived in Iran were Aryan. To be the king of Iran was to be the king of the land that the Aryans inhabit. It really isn't until the 1700s, 1800s, as we start to get the rise of early modern race theory, right, with the rise of sort of anthropology and archaeology. It, it's not until that time period that Aryan becomes associated as a racial con construct or a racial category. And it's specifically used by European anthropologists to argue that there is a genetic biological difference between the Aryan people and Semitic people. That is, you know, people from Judea, people from uh, Arabia. Um, and, and that, of course, will pave the road to a very dangerous, um, uh, you know, method of race cataloging and race construction that culminates with the horrors of the Holocaust. However, this is all to say that the term Aryan um, does not in and of itself signal whiteness or white supremacy. It really goes back all the way to the ancient Iranian world to signify the noble peoples who lived in the, the Persian Empire. I always, every now and again, you'll hear, you know, on the radio or in some documentary, some white supremacist moron talking about the supremacy of the Aryan people. And my response is always, um, like Chef Ramsay, you know, you stupid donkey. Like it would take you five minutes of Googling to realize that the Aryan race is a complete construct out of the early modern period. Um, but I'm going to hold back that rant and, and we'll press on. Um, for the Iranians, they themselves had a concept of imperial power, which they called Iransha, right? The rule over the Aryan uh, region or Iran itself. And unlike the Roman Empire, which really tended to construct their identity in relation to, um, you know, birthplace, I think that for the Iranians, what it means to be the king of Iran is, is largely construed in terms of broad territory, right? He who can hold the land of the Aryans. We see that control over what is now, of course, today known as Iran, Iraq, some parts of India, chronologically shifts uh, from the classical period into the late Roman Empire. We start with the Achaemenid Persians. These are the Persians in the movie 300, right? Xerxes, Darius. We have Alexander's conquests and his successors, the Seleucids, in this very brief period in which the Middle East is being controlled by Macedonians. And then after sort of the fading of the Seleucid Empire, what we have, what we as a class have been looking at are the Parthian people over that 500-ish year period, and then the Sasanian Persians. Of course, towards the very end of this class, we will just begin to scratch the surface of uh, the Islamic um, uh, revolution, right, that overtakes much of North Africa and the Middle East. But for the re remainder of our class, we'll mostly be thinking of the, the Middle East Iran as being under the control of the Sasanian Persians. 
I'd now like to switch. We've, so we've just kind of covered some general terminology to the historical rise of the Sasanian Persians. And in order to grasp that, you have to first understand the very sort of different way in which the Persian slash Parthian Empire controlled its different regions, which was to really employ local faculty, uh, sorry, not faculty, local royalty or local um, uh, sort of satraps throughout the various provinces. Boy, I think I just had a Freudian slip there where I was dreaming of how nice it would be as a faculty member to rule large parts of the world, but <laughs> that's a fantasy for another day. The Roman Empire really operates on a govern governorship model in which the emperor and the senate work together to appoint governors to go out temporarily to different provinces. And then, of course, as we have seen, emperors themselves can move province to province as needed, especially in the third century. The Parthian Empire, though, and the Sasanian Persian Empire operated on a, on a very different model, which was to install permanent satrap families within different regions of its empire who would pass power down generation to generation. And one of the reasons that this was successful is that there was a mutually beneficial relationship between the Parthian or Persian emperor and the royal families that, that he installed and supported. So you can see on this map, I have circled the region of Persis or uh, Fars, right, or also known as Pars. It is for this reason that Romans came to call the Persians Persians, right? They heard the name Pars, P Persis, Persepolis, and they said, oh, that, you know, these are people from Persia. But of course, Pars was just one smaller region within the sweeping Parthian Persian Empire. Now, if you were installed as a satrap in a place like Pars, then your job is to be an instrument of the Persian government, but also to supply tribute military support as needed. So if the new Persian emperor wishes to lead a campaign against the Romans or further south into Egypt, you could be expected to be called on at any moment to supply or support um, the elite uh, leadership within the Persian nobility uh, and cavalry. Within each of these kingdoms themselves, we see a pretty impressive degree of stability because unlike the Roman governorship model, regional power is passed down for the most part family to family. So if I am the son of the satrap of, of Persis, then I can expect one day myself to grow into that role. And that creates this, you know, sometimes centuries long stability in which uh, one satrap family will serve uh, the Persian emperor at will. Now, the story of the rise of the Sasanians will actually come out of this very region of Pars, and it very much has to do with the dispute within a ruling family, although evidence is a little bit precarious, as we'll see in just a minute. So the first emperor of the Sasanian Persians is a leader known as Ardashir I. And Ardashir is a little bit like a George Washington type figure, right? He's, he's located somewhere in the nexus of myth and history. And there are many great legends about him, you know, sort of prophesying his birth or his rise to power. I like to think of him as well as kind of a Romulus and Remus figure. Clearly there was a first, um, but sometimes his story is so enshrouded in legend and myth that it can be tough to disentangle the real truth of that narrative. Nonetheless, I'm going to try to present you what I think historians are fairly confident might be one account of the rise of Ardashir, and his story starts in Pars when his father, who is the satrap or the, the sort of regional power of Fars, dies. So the Parthian Empire bumped along pretty successfully until about the early 200s. Um, and somewhere around the years between 205 and the 220s, we know that the governor of Pars dies. And his name, we're fairly confident about this from coinage, is Pabag or Papak. Um, and we know that Pabag has two sons potentially at the ready to inherit uh, his, his regional power over Pars. Now, one aspect of Persian 
um, governance that's quite different from other monarchies, especially in the Middle Ages, is that there's no rule of primogeniture. And that means that the firstborn son is not necessarily the default chosen to be the next ruler to inherit power. We also see how this can sometimes very dangerously play out in polygamous royal families, right, where we have the king with many wives and then many, many sons. And the expectation is that in a family like that, the sons will kind of duke it out to see who can earn their father's favor and who will rise to the top. So this story about fraternal conflict that I'm about to share with you very much feeds into that understanding that when a Persian father or Persian ruler dies, it isn't necessarily his firstborn son, but the son who can sort of hold on to power most successfully or make the best case for himself. Now, Ardashir uh, begins to emerge in a conflict because uh, Pabag did in fact favor his eldest son named Shapur and designated him to rule Pars as the next satrap. But the younger son, Ardashir, was able to actually successfully challenge his older brother, Shapur. And even though both were slated to meet on the battlefield, that battle never happened because Shapur dies before they meet in battle. The exact reasons for how and why Shapur died are unclear. Um, there certainly might be some foul play from, from Ardashir himself, but that's quite difficult to pin down. Now the questions of who's, like what is the basis of these families' power really comes into dispute. And I think the Darai reading pointed out pretty successfully that there might be a more military style version of this story versus a more religious style version of this story. Papag's identity, I mean, he's clearly a, a figure of importance in Pars. In one version of the story, um, Papak is actually credited with himself challenging some of the Parthian leaders. And so it might be that Ardashir is getting this idea of overthrowing the Parthians from his family line. And if you see on Darai page 12, I can see in my slide it's a little blurry here, but essentially the historical warrior version of the story is that Ardashir rebels against his, his father or he rebels against his brother uh, Shapur after their father's death and claims the throne. There is another, maybe not opposing, but more complex version of this story though, which is the account that Pabag was a, a lead priest of the fire temple of Anahid, Anahid being one of the most important deities um, in ancient Persia. And that for this reason, after his father's death, Ardashir sort of claims a divine connection to Anahid and uses that divine claim to advance his own power, maybe after his brother had died. It's really hard to sift out these two varying accounts, but in either case, I don't think they should surprise us. What we see from Ardashir is a very opportunistic leader, right? Someone who recognizes the chance to rise to the throne of Pars and beyond, even after um, uh, the passing of his father and the favoring of his older brother. We can be pretty confident that there was some tension between Ardashir and his older brother, in part because of coinage. You all know how much I love coinage. Um, and here we have a coin um, that shows us on the left side, Pabag, um, sort of de denoting himself as Satrap, and on the right side is his eldest son, Shapur. Very obviously missing from this coin is Ardashir, and the fact that this coinage disappears and will be replaced by Ardashir's, again, indicates that whatever exactly was the cause of Shapur's death, that Ardashir took that opportunity to insert himself into royal governance. Now, one thing that appears to be different about Ardashir from, from his brother, even his father, is that being the satrap of Pars, the local territorial leader, was not enough for Ardashir's ambition. And Ardashir is sometimes described like a, like a young Octavian Augustus, right? Dreams of conquering the whole world through sort of political savvy um, to promote himself. And um, you know, as we get into the 210s and the 220s, uh, Ardashir will begin to challenge not only his brother and his brother fo brother's followers, but the leader of the Parthian Empire himself, the followers of Ardawan. 
Now, Ardawan we know of again because of coinage, uh, was a, a sort of long-standing leader of the Parthians. In our Persian sources, he's called Ardawan. In more of our Greco-Roman sources, he's called Artabanus, usually Artabanus V. And what's surprising about Ardashir is that he's really challenging the very premise of the satrap relationship. At the beginning of this video, I talked about the fact that this relationship between the Parthian emperor and the satrap is supposed to be mutually beneficial. The guy on the bottom supplies troops and tribute. The guy on the top makes sure that your royal family stays in power. But Ardashir is unafraid to challenge even Ardawan himself. And after sending a few, you know, leading generals to try to quash Ardashir's revolt, eventually Ardawan himself is drawn into open conflict with Ardashir in his very province. Uh, now, at this time, uh, uh, Artabanus V or Ardawan was occupying more of central Mesopotamia up towards uh, Armenia, perhaps in an effort to sort of reclaim some of the territory taken by the Romans. But around the year 224, uh, as our sources will, will show in just a second, Artabanus is really given no choice but to come directly into Pars to put down the revolt of Ardashir. And uh, again, I think this indicates that Ardashir's rebellion had gotten powerful enough that Artabanus felt the need to come to him. We don't know a ton about their conflict, but we know that it took place on what we're to call the plains um, of Horm Hormozgon. Boy, say that five times fast. I can see on my map here that you can barely see Hormozgon. I'll make sure to send this around a slide so that you can zoom in. But it's, it's a city right down on the Persian Gulf, sort of deep into this Pars territory. And from what we can tell, um, Ardashir, and especially his cavalry, really trampled over Ardawan. Um, and one of the sources I'm going to give you tonight to, to read actually says that Ardashir, after dehorsing Ardawan, physically tramples on his head and declares himself to be king of kings. That classic Parthian slash Achaemenid Persian title to indicate that Ardashir has risen above his status as a local king, a satrap, and has taken on complete control of Iran Shar, the, the rule over the Aryan peoples. So in one fell swoop, Ardashir manages to topple the governance of the Parthian Empire and to install himself and his own uh, descendant line as the new royal family of the Persians. Again, the extent to which someone living on the outskirts of, of the uh, Parthian Empire would have felt this transition is really hard to detect. Um, but clearly Ardashir's victory sent enough of a reverberation throughout the Mediterranean that both the Romans and Persian sources would later pick up on it. I'd like to kind of close out this video by sharing with you a little bit of the visual evidence we have of Ardashir I. One of the hard aspects of studying the Sasanian Persians, like the Parthians, is that we have relatively few contemporary sources directly from them. Most of what we know about Ardashir and his line will come from later Middle Persian, even Arabic sources. So anytime we have a chance to look at contemporary evidence, it's really helpful here. And I think what this evidence shows us is that Ardashir I was a master propagandist. We still have in modern day Iran uh, several relief scenes depicting what we think is this battle um, of Hormozgan. And if you can just sort of make it out, you can tell that what's being foregrounded here is a cavalry battle, right? Um, I think in this particular scene, we see Ardashir unseating Ardawan. Um, in almost a sort of noble jousting act, right? He looks like he's got a spear and is sort of poking him off. This scene is going to underscore the enduring importance of the Persian cavalry and the sense that true Persian nobles fight on horseback as both a demonstration of their domestication of the, the unnatural, of, of the, sorry, of the natural world, but also of their, their sheer horsemanship. In this other scene, which is an even better high relief, um, we see Ardashir celebrating his own coronation. 
On the left side is Ardashir, right, sort of wearing the, the classic crown of the Sasanian Persians. And on the right side is the supreme god Ahura Mazda, who is passing over to him uh, the, the circle of Ahura Mazda, the crown, which marks his divine right to rule. One thing that hasn't changed in all these centuries of Eastern-Western relations is this much stronger sense that uh, kingship in the East is divine. And if you caught this in our Darai reading, the first one, it talks about how when you went to see the Sasanian emperor, you didn't actually get to see him directly face to face. He usually is behind a veil. And this is because it's thought that the emperor himself as this manifestation of the divine should not be visible or even necessarily consulted by the average person. Now, Ardashir's conquests of the former Parthian Empire continued well after uh, his defeat of Artabanus V. We know that Ardashir even had ambitions to retake some of, you know, the, the sort of Roman territories in the east of Syria. He invades Cappadocia, which is sort of modern day Turkey. Uh, he invades Syria. But here we're going to see the beginning of a trend that's going to last us all the way into the 600s CE, which is the sort of never ending dance over who controls the borders of the east. Um, at the time, we have one of the last rulers of the Severan dynasty, Alexander Severus, um, who is sort of fending off Ardashir to the best of his ability. But Ardashir isn't really able to pursue the Romans much past the city of Antioch. So kind of like these two forces that keep each other in check, we'll now see the beginning of this ongoing pattern of, you know, Rome constantly trying to push further east and the Sasanian Persians constantly trying to push further west. And it'll be this conflict which really comes to define Eastern and Western relations um, for the remainder of our class, which is one of the reasons why I suggested you might want to consider um, Shapur as uh, you know, one of the great Roman adversaries uh, for a potential second research paper. Ardashir I will go down in history as sort of the great founder of the Sasanian Empire, but one of the reasons I think his legacy gets sealed is because of his own son, whom he will name Shapur, perhaps after his brother. Get used to this, by the way, from here on out, we're going to see a lot of Romans named after each other and a lot of Persians named after each other. So we had Shapur, the older brother, but now we have what is known as Emperor Shapur I, which is this, who is the son of Ardashir and will come to govern uh, the Sasanian Empire after his father. And it's this ability to have two back-to-back -back emperors who are both militarily powerful, ambitious, expansionist in policy that will seal the Sasanian control and prevent a sort of another overturning by the Parthians down the road. As we follow along for the rest of this class, we'll be seeing the sort of rise and fall of several other Sasanian emperors. We will not have time to talk nearly about all of them. We'll hit a few of the big ones. Um, but Shapur I, you know, with a reign of about 30 years, has about as big an impact on the Sasanian Persian Empire as his father will have on its uh, origins. And so together, having back-to-back -back rulers who our successful consolidating figures is what will seal the effectiveness of Sasanian rule right up until um, the Islamic conquest. All right, I hope this provided some good background. Take a breather, get a stretch, and then uh, maybe come back to my second video a little bit on the governance of the Sasanian Persian Empire.